Good morning, everyone. And uh, we're continuing the study on Judges 13, which is sort of the preamble to Samson. So it's leading up to the birth of Samson. And um, we struggled with this a bit. So we're going to need God's Holy Spirit to help us as we continue this study. So let's pray. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful once again to be able to come together to study your word. Even though we are separated by distance, we know that we are united in heart and mind through thy spirit as we are united with Christ. And we ask now for uh, help as we study your word, as we apply uh, the book of Judges to our, our, our time. We know, Lord, that there are many different things we need to consider and to sort through and to understand. And so we need your direction. May you speak directly to each one of us and guide and lead us in the understanding of this message. We also pray for this movement, Lord, uh, for those that have not been studying. Uh, we pray that uh, an invitation can be given to them and that they will accept it and continue uh, to grow in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning, everyone. So... <clears throat> Uh, yesterday, we, well, the last two days, so we've been looking at Judges 13. We had drawn out uh, some initial ideas regarding Judges 13. And then yesterday, we addressed um, specifically the connection between uh, 1886, December 6th, which is the end of this camp meeting where uh, Wagner and Butler have um a conflict over the law in Galatians. I know in 1887, Ellen White writes some counsel regarding that, which we read. And um, also there's an, another point too, which I brought up in the Friday studies. And it's uh, a book that we're going to look at. Uh, I'm just going to show you here. Now, this is um, E.G. White disc, <clears throat> and there is a book uh, called The Gospel in Galatians, a review by E.J. Wagner. Now, this is published in 1888. Um, so the controversy that uh, had begun in 1886 uh, was then uh, Wagner wrote this this response to Butler had written a book. So Butler had written a book in 1887, and that was February 10th, 1887, uh, that uh, his book was published. So they put Butler's book, and then we have um, E.J. Wagner's book. Now, E.J. Wagner's dad, um, Joseph Harvey Wagner, he, he had a controversy regarding this. So he was the one who really first introduced some of these ideas regarding the law in Galatians. And Alan White was given information that he was not um, perfect in his understanding. And, and this also applied to E.J. Wagner as well. So, so when we looked at this, it, it went back to what happened at the 1886 General Conference. and. The 1885 General Conference ended on December 6th, and 13 uh, biblical months later, um, on December 6th, 1886. Is that how it worked? That doesn't make sense to me. According to what has been published by the General Conference, that's exactly how it worked. Yes. So from the start of 
the camp meeting in 1885 to the end, or the general conference in 1885, which was November 18th, to the end of the general conference. So that's so that's what I was doing wrong. I knew there was something that didn't make sense. Um, so anyway, we're going to look at that book. So just over here, I need to go to uh, to get these 13 months. I need to do November. Uh, 18, 1885 to December 6th. So that's the start of one general conference to the end of the next one. They both end on December 6th and they both begin on November 18th. <clears throat> and then the number of days of that conference is 19, right? For each of these conferences, 18 if we count um, cardinal and 19 if we count ordinal, correct? Is that how we? Correct. So that's how we had counted that. Um, Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really sure exactly how to understand all of this. Um, what we, what we did conclude is that this does connect um, our December 6th, 2020 back to this controversy, but particularly how, what, what this particularly means that I don't think we, we fully understand. Now, this came, of course, from Dwight's study dealing with um, uh, connecting the four generations. And we haven't looked at the four generations yet as periods of 40 years. Um, any other thoughts about what we did yesterday in connection with these December 6th days? All right. As you just pointed out, we have two general conference sessions, each mm -hmm. lasting 19 days. Yeah. It's a very odd situation that these were two consecutive conferences, each lasting 19 days, each ending on December 6th. Mm -hmm. Now, as a symbol, what do we see with the number 19? Well, it starts the, the prophetic mirror. So we have that, that idea there. Okay. So from 742 BC to 723 BC, we have a time period that begins the prophetic mirror of 19 years, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's intriguing in this situation that within this prophetic mirror, we also have the period of 2,300 Arab and Boker, evening, morning, that we call the 2,300-day prophecy, right? Okay. Now, 19 as a symbol becomes interesting because after the passing of Sister White, we had a Bible conference in 1919. Yeah. Again, here is 19 being doubled. Yeah. What were two of the major themes that came away from that Bible conference? 
Well, the 1919 Bible Conference was basically the idea that we need to have our ministers um, accredited, right? So they need to go and study in Protestant universities to become, to officially receive their doctorates and master degrees and the degrees of divinity and so forth. And, and also, well, whether that's, I mean, there was this, this idea that we, we needed to update our literature so that it reflected um, scholarly opinion. Now, <clears throat> I was looking at a couple of other points. To me, the major points were, number one, the attendees were questioning the inspiration of Ellen White. Yeah, and that and that was part of the that was part of the whole thing dealing with the literature. Now, it there was this questioning of it. I mean, it was sort of a rejection of the idea that we're going to reject Ellen White's inspiration. So, so they didn't, but they did at least discuss it. But it was Wag uh, or Prescott uh, pushing for that. All right, <clears throat> and he does it in a very subtle way too. Correct. I mean, you know, it's not like opening. I don't think the Ellen, Ellen White is inspired or anything like that. But he starts to question statements in the spirit of prophecy, whether they reflect historical accuracy, and whether whether or not these should be updated and corrected. And well, so that point came up, people were starting to, to see where he was going with it, but they did discuss it in my reading of, of those documents. But there was quite a bit of opposition to that. Now, it's also interesting that one of the other points that, that he came out with mm -hmm. was he wished to never again have to give any presentation on the 2300 days. Okay. Yeah. Now I know you've said that. I, I don't remember reading that when I read it, but read the 1990 19 Bible conference. Okay. Um, how do you get that reference where he, he says that just so we have it. Okay. In, <clears throat> In the documents that the conference has published. Yeah, so the 1990, 1919 Bible Conference um, minutes or whatever you want to call them. Correct. On page 75, which you will find dated for July 3rd of 1919. But this is also page number 170 of the entire notes yeah. toward the bottom of the page a question is asked by Prescott what is the purpose of teaching the 2300 days I don't want to preach these I don't want to preach three nights on the 2300 days not one night that isn't the way I view the subject what Brother Worth has said seems to emphasize the idea that doctrinal points are the leading things to handle. I don't look at it that way. I don't want the 2300 days as a mathematical demonstration from BC 457 to 1844. Okay. Now, I'll make sure that a copy from this is sent up to you. You can then pull a copy back off of what the conference has presented. I, I have it right here. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so that's the, okay, so I see what you're saying. So, it, I mean, it, it, there's a little bit of a context there, um, which I think is actually quite important. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. Before us right now, we have this diagram addressing the 40 years. Mm -hmm. The point that I had brought up was that these two general conference sessions consecutively 
were both each 19 days. We have the 1919 Bible Conference with its issues within the church. And as a question, how long did that Bible Conference go on? Um, I used to know. don't remember. The 1919 Bible Conference began July 1st of 1919 and ended August 9th of 1919. Okay. July 1st, August 19th. July 1st to August 9th. Yeah. How many days is that? Well, it would be uh, 40 days. Right. So <clears throat> we're dealing with 40 years. The church had this meeting for 40 days. In the 40 days in 1919, the table was being further set to reject the foundational documents or the foundational doctrines that had led to the formation of the movement and to seek to join more closely with the other Protestant churches that were then existing. Yeah. Yeah, because, well, Prescott had this idea, and, and especially with the introduction of the periodical called uh, The Protestant. Right. Is that he felt that he could win the Protestants over by sort of aligning with them, becoming scholarly, becoming recognized, no longer being seen as a cult. I mean, this is... I mean, it's not really where this begins, but this where this sort of officially begins um, with the church after the death of Ellen White. Um, and these ideas, of course, really came from the same place that Canwright's ideas came from, in the sense, if we want to be recognized, if we want to have an influence, we need to get rid of these things that are creating the prejudice. Right. And so one of those, of course, would be the spirit of prophecy. They won't, I mean, it, it's foolish now. It's easy to look back on this and see how foolish it is. Um, but for people like Prescott, and, and this spirit, of course, has pervaded Adventism, they don't like being recognized as the cult. And, and instead of taking our pe peculiar truths and presenting them in powerful ways, they water them down um, and think that this is how they're going to reach uh, the Protestant world. But it's extremely short-sighted, which is kind of an understatement, but. Okay, so my question here, <clears throat> do we see a comparison or a comparative between W.W. W. Prescott and Parminder Bayant? Well, yeah, there's no doubt about that. During the life of Ellen White, Prescott gave many sermons that Mrs. White was very complimentary upon. Especially when uh, Jones, Prescott, and Sister White traveled together, presenting righteousness by faith in the, in the early uh, 1890s. Well, <clears throat> by 1891, Ellen White had been sent to Australia, right? Yeah. So when, when was it that she traveled with, uh, what's, what's the dates? I'm trying to remember them. I don't remember them. Okay. Um, here, I'll, I'll find it. Because uh, I, I always had this impression it was early 90s but um um so i can't remember when it was but um oh. Uh, 
I'm going to have to figure that out again. But anyway, she did travel with Pro, with Jones Press and Prescott presenting Righteousness by Faith. But exactly which years that was. Might have been, because I know it was after 1888 and before she went to Australia. So. I remember <clears throat> Mrs. White and Jones and Wagner presenting righteousness by faith. No, it wasn't Wagner, it was Prescott. Wagner didn't travel with Sister White and, and those. Uh, um, and, and then they had the one sermon in particular is they had, it was recorded in a newspaper, Topeka, Kansas Daily Capital or something that, like that. This is a long time ago. That's why my memory's kind of uh, fails me on this. Um, yeah, so I'm going to have to find that out. I, I know I'm going to uh, uh, cover this when we deal with uh, uh, these presentations. Um, so I'm sorry I'm not wasn't really ready for this, but uh, yeah, the Daily Capital is the name. Okay, um, is in May eighteenth, eighteen eighty nine. Uh, Jones did this sermon. And I'm pretty sure then, so it must have been 1889 then, in 1890, uh, that Jones, uh, Prescott, and Sister White traveled. But I'll find, you know, maybe, maybe Wagner did do some of this, but um, I'll find out more about it later. But anyway, go on. All right. <clears throat> now, at this point, we have a symbol of 40 years as we were applying yesterday to the 40 years in the wilderness. We have a time period of 40 days occurring in 1919, a year of a doubling of a symbol that we apply to the prophetic mirror. Yeah. Now, In this, when, when we were looking at the situation with November 8th, 1885 to December 6th, 1886, yeah. we have established that this was the period of 13 months, which would have been one Jewish leap year. Yeah, a deficient. A deficient. Right. But it's still a symbol that we should be looking at and that we need to pay attention with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, as we were looking at this with Manoa and his wife, when we came to verses 8 to 14, we had established that here again, Christ came to Manoah's wife. He came to the woman as she sat in the field. She then ran to her husband, seeking him. He arose, went with her, and sought answers from what had been said. Mm -hmm. Now, we were going over this, <clears throat> that the woman at that point was the symbol of an unfruitful church. As she sat in the field, she was not being active. She was not reaping. She was not sowing. Mm -hmm. When we come back to this message, she then becomes active and runs to her husband. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the balance of what we're looking at with this We have God listening to the voice of the husband. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man, came to the angel of God. And we've identified that as being Christ, correct? And said unto Christ, art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And Christ's response, which caused the Sadducees and Pharisees so much consternation, was, I am. And Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child or how shall, and how shall we do after him? But the alternate reading would be, what shall be the manner of the child and what shall be his work? As we look at this, what is the purpose of the message? Because as, as we've been looking at this, Samson is a message. Yeah. So what shall be the purpose of the message? Well, the message is a message of, of warning. Um, but it's, it's meant to correct. It's to show us our, our work. Right now, what we're going through is we're trying to understand what our message is and what it is we're supposed to do. Then, but we know it's a warning message, right, to, to the church. It's meant to correct uh, the errors that Adventism has had creep into it. Is this a message only to the church? Well, I think it's primarily um, in the context of how we're studying this. I mean, this is a message primarily to us. I don't think it's really a message to the church in, in what we're looking at in Judges. I mean, this, this is something that's to correct us, to prepare us to give a message. That message is to the church. But the message of Samson in the context in which we're looking at it, the application that we're making is more a message to us. So the question <clears throat> that Manoah asked Mm -hmm. What shall be the manner of the child? What shall be his work? We know that this is then a, or we could, we could accept, I believe, that this is a message of reformation. And if we refuse the reformation, it becomes a message of judgment. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. And, and the problem in this movement is that we didn't think we even needed reformation. Right. We just thought the church needed reformation. And that's the primary problem in the church presently, in that we think that the problem lies all outside of us. But it doesn't. No. I mean, there is a problem outside of us, but that's not a problem that we can actually address unless we first address the problem inside of us and, and not just in the movement in general, but in indiv individually within each one of us, you know, so it's been clear since July 18th that we were not prepared 
for the responsibility that would have come upon us if Nashville had hit, been hit by a nuclear attack by Islam. But we, we didn't even realize how unfit we are. Right. So, I mean, we're unfit and we might have realized, OK, we're unfit. You know, maybe, you know, we weren't ready for what's going to happen. We could sort of sense that. But we had no idea to what extent uh, God wanted to change us. And, and I don't know if we even fully understand that yet. But at least we have much more appreciation of our deficiencies. And and that what it's going to take uh, for us to fulfill our role. Okay. So <clears throat> was Manoa and his wife deficient at the time that this message was given to them? Well, She's a barren woman, right? Okay. And Manoah, of course, is a message, right? So this is a message attached to this woman. This is the message. I mean, if you wanted to look at it, there's different ways you could look at it. But we know that this, we've looked at this message as the message of rest. So it is, it is the everlasting gospel. But it's also tied up to prophecy, like the 2520, the seven times. Um, and so this relationship between the woman who is barren and her husband, which is a message. I mean, this is the message that was given Adventism. This is what is examined um, really at 9-11, because this is talking about 9-11. And so at 9-11, um, when this mighty angel comes down, there's this examination of this message. But, but the result is going to be this other message, the message of Samson. Right? So we can see we have this inheritance. This movement has arises at a time in which really the church is in rebellion. Right. And, and God is going to give this message, the mighty message, or the message of the mighty angel of Revelation 18. So we're now in the Sunday law time period. And yet the church doesn't know this. Right. Manoah and his wife don't understand the message. And they can't understand it because it's secret, right? Because Christ, it, it, Palmoni had not come into play. We've rejected time prophecies. I mean, so it definitely relates to, to the church being in this condition, but a message arising that is going to deliver God's people, right? And so... So when we look at this message, we say, well, okay, this is about uh, a message to give to the Levites. But when we look at Samson himself, we can see that Samson represents this message. And that Samson is not, he's not really fit for this responsibility that he's been given. Right? So he has all these negative aspects. But it relates to the line in, in this ironic sense, because it, it, it's, it's a reform line. Like that's what we have here in the story of Samson. But it's a reform line that we don't expect, especially in the context of all that has happened previously in Judges. But in this situation, Samson, when he comes on the scene, is going to have great strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't take, when it's ironic, we don't take everything and, and turn it negative. 
right? Because there's certain aspects and it's more the, the moral aspects that are ironic, right? right? But the illustration of reform line is still like all other illustrations of reform lines, right? All the other things are not ironic. It's just morally ironic. Samson doesn't have the character that we would expect for a judge. Correct. But Samson doesn't have the character either of a strong message until we start to look at this ironically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's physically strong, right? So he has all the strength. He can overcome the enemies and so forth. And yet he's morally deficient. Right. So in Judges 13, 13, mm -hmm. what we have here, of course, is another doubling, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But it's the doubling of the symbols of rebellion. Yeah. And of the chapter that it is, of course. So, um, now, now you had mentioned that you know, the idea that this might be a chiasm, this chapter. Correct. And, you know, when, when you look at this chapter, I mean, it's, it's going to be 25 verses, right? Right. Um, the 13th verse is the center verse, right? There's 12 verses before and 12 verses after. Right. Or, or is that how it works? Let me see. One, two, three. I guess technically. No, I mean, technically, I think you're right. Yeah. So that's what I'm. Yeah. Because, yeah, because I have to count inclusively. Right. So there's 12 verses before and 12 verses after. Um, so this is the center verse. This being the center verse. Um, uh, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. I mean, if the woman is the barren church, I mean, this is to be a message to the church. Right. It's a warning message to the church. Correct. And, and, and Christ is going to say this to Manoah. So when we deal with Manoah, we know that this is a message that has been married to the church, is married to the church. and. And that would go back to the foundation of the message, right? That would be the message dealing with what, what arose in Millerite history, because that's what's examined. That's what's repeated in our history. Correct. So could we say that Manoah is this repeat of history? Well, that is very possible. I was looking at it as Manoah possibly being the movement. Well, it's, but, but it's a message, right? So this, Correct. Yeah, so obviously the message is the movement repeats this history. So they're, they're not separated, but I'm just saying, if you look at it as a message, it's a message that is a repeat of history. And it, and it's from Noah, right? Manoah. Right. I know. From, yeah. So it, it's from this this previous message. This message of rest. And, and so, we, you know, we look at it as the seven times, and I think to a large degree, that's what it is. But it, it encompasses more than that, because being rest, it represents um, the gospel. You know, and the Sabbath, the Sunday law as well. So, you know, the issue of the Sabbath and the Sunday law. Okay, so as the center point of the chiasm, 1313, mm -hmm. is of all that I have said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. So if she is not to eat of the vine, what is she not to eat? 
Well, well, grapes. And then we have this, neither let her drink wine nor strong drink. So that's Is, grapes that have been processed. Okay. <clears throat> anything alcoholic. But if we take this symbolically to the church, we are not to accept any doctrine mm -hmm. except that that has already been established in the past. Right. And, and of course, this is Isaiah 28 as well. Right. Now, why the admonition to not eat any unclean thing? What symbolically can we derive from that? Oh, well, that would be association with the Protestants, Protestant method of study. Now, the thing is, this is also a repeat of verse 7, right? Okay. What was said to the woman is going to be now said to Manoah. So we're looking at this. This is a repeat seven verses later of what was initially given to the woman. Right. Why is it important that it was repeated seven verses later? Well, it's related to the seven times. But it's, this is also that the church that's barren, I mean, is given this message. But it's also going to be given to Manoah. The message that was given to the woman, to the church, is also going to be given to Manoah. So, so again, this, this fits the ideas that we've been talking about. Uh, that this is, one is, it's a repeat of the message from the past. It's a repeat of history. Okay. So we have this repeat of history that the church and movement together are admonished that all that I commanded her, let her observe. Mm -hmm. I found it intriguing from the spirit of prophecy that it was written in answer to this petition, the angel again appeared and Manoah's anxious inquiry was, how shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? The previous instruction was repeated. Of all that I've said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her observe. Manoah and his wife knew not that the one thus addressing them was Jesus Christ. They looked upon him as the Lord's messenger, but whether a prophet or an angel, they were at a loss to determine. Wishing to manifest hospitality toward their guest, they entreated him to remain while they should prepare for him a kid. But in their ignorance of his character, they knew not whether to offer it for a burnt offering or to place it before him as food. Why are they looking to detain Christ? As is being presented in verse 15. I mean, they, they had wanted to know how to order the child. So now that they're, they're wanting to detain him, I mean, they want to know more about him. Because they're not sure, certain who he is. Is it that they're not certain as to the source of the message? Yeah.
are they looking to impede the progress of the message? I don't think so. I don't think that's what's being being done. I mean, I don't think that's their purpose. I'm looking at this symbolically. Yeah, well, I mean, me too, right? Okay. So, so I don't think this detaining is, is meant to impede the progress of the message. I mean, to some degree, it, it does do that. So in verse 16, Christ responds unto Manoah, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. If thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that this was Jesus Christ. Right. So there's this kind of strange way in which Christ is communicated. Because he knows that they don't fully understand who he is. But he's hinting at who he is. Right. Because he's not going to eat your bread. And if you do offer it, you need to offer it unto the Lord. No, because Manoah doesn't really know that this is the angel of the Lord or Christ. And that's why then he's going to answer, what is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And then the angel of the Lord said unto him, why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? So here again, you, we, we looked at this before, but we know that this is Palmoni. Um, but then the question, in some ways, is, is also rhetorical. Um, and, and it's sort of hard to, to get the sense of why he's asking the question this way. Why askest thou thus my after my name? Um, seeing you don't know it, I mean, if you translated it that way, it would kind of be an odd thing, because that you would naturally ask after somebody's name, if it's secret, right? Well, but it's not just thou askest after my, askest thou thus after my name. So the question is, why are you going through this process to understand who I am? Was this a good translation from the Hebrew to the word secret? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, that word secret is a difficult one. I mean, it's obviously from where Palmoni comes from. Um, pa, pali or Pili in here in the Hebrew. Let me see here, verse 18. So it's just going to have uh, the Pali. And uh, when, you, when you look at that word in Brown Drivers Briggs, it gets there. Um, oh, looking at the wrong word here. Um, means wonderful, incomprehensible, extra, extraordinary, right? So secret, I mean, is not necessarily how, I mean, you can translate it that way. Um, but properly, it means to separate, that is distinguish literally or figuratively by implication, to be, causatively make, great, difficult, wonderful. So, um, so it has all these different uh, sort of connotations. Um, now, of course, the word wonderful, we don't use in, in the same sense that it used to be used, right? Because wonderful used to mean full of wonder. But wonder itself was more a type of questioning. Like when we wonder about something, right? So something to be wonderful is something that needs to be contemplated or looked upon or examined. Um, it's, it's something that's incomprehensible, I guess, is the other one, which would be probably, and, and, and that's probably the way that you would translate it if you're going to really translate it into modern English, 
you say, why are you asking after my name, seeing it's, it's incomprehensible? Right? I mean, if you're just going to give it a literal translation. But it also has this symbolic significance because of its connection with the wonderful number. Right? So, I mean, in some ways, I guess these numbers are incomprehensible. That is, we can't fully understand all of this, this symbolism. But it's, it's something that is being revealed to us as well. So when Christ reveals the 2300 days, it, it is a puzzle that needs to be understood. I, I, you know, the one thing I don't understand is why the King James translates it a certain saint um, instead of translating it like it does in the margin, the wonderful number, because that's the marginal reading. But yeah, so I would say to say it is secret is is an incomplete translation. How how would that be? I could <clears throat> I could definitely concur. It just doesn't tell everything about that word. But it's not wrong. It's not as linguistically clear as it could be. Right. So why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is wonderful? Because then as we compare that with Isaiah 9, 6, we would have a scriptural example that this was indeed Christ. Um. For unto us a child is born, for un unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now, this is slightly different form, Pali, but still the idea. Uh, and Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So you have that word Wonderful. And if they had translated it as Wonderful, we might make that connection more clearly, you know, more readily. Now, just a thing about the chiasm. Right. Because uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily call this a true chiasm. I mean, it's not an absolute perfect mirror in the sense that you don't have the verses at the beginning lining up with the verses at the end answering to them. But you do have a general chiasm in that, um, you know, you're going to have the directions to, to the woman. And when she goes to tell her husband, he says, neither told me his name, right? Well, actually, I guess then you're going to have then the direction. So that is a mirror, right? So you're going to have name and then the directions. And then at the end, you're going to have the directions, then the name. So that's a mirror, right? Correct. But some of the structure isn't fully uh, chiastic, but this is, right? You're going to have all these other things that happen afterwards sort of repeated afterwards but just if you take around this um just around these these ideas you can you can see the suggestion of a mirror but it's going to repeat in the second section some of the things um in reverse order not everything well when i was looking at this as a chiasm yeah I was having to consider the prophetic mirror from 742 to 1863. Mm -hmm. Now, here again, we have a time period. We have a time period where a pronouncement is made where Israel and then Judah are no longer going to be controlling their own destinies. We have one of these ending in 1798. We have the rest of the structure ending in 1863. 
when I'm looking at this, we have 40 years of Philistine oppression. After the 40 years are complete, the message comes to an unfruitful church. The woman then tells her husband the message. The husband seeks for the message to be repeated to him. Sitting in a field, Christ appears to the woman. She runs for her husband. He comes. The message is then repeated. Mm -hmm. They then seek to detain and honor the messenger and the message. Christ makes it clear he will not be detained. Yet, at that point, the church, using other teachings, seeks to put itself in greater stead than the message. And the reason I'm looking at this in, in such a way, we are very familiar with the warning that was given in the book of Daniel at Belshazzar's impious feast. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that any of us have a difficulty if I was to say many, many tekel Upharsin represents 126 shekels. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yet, how do we apply that many, many tekel you farsen with the 126 shekels to the 2520, to the seven times of Leviticus 26? How do we make that application? Well, one way is we take that there's 20 um, giras to a shekel. So, right. So it's 25, 20 gira. But I think part of it is we also connect chapter four and chapter five together. Right. We have a, a 25, 20 symbolically represented by Nebuchadnezzar, his seven years of insanity. And we have then the story of Belshazzar. Now, there's other ways, of course, um, because... Belshazzar's not just tied to, um, you know, the 2520. He's also tied to the end of the 70-year prophecy that's mentioned in Jeremiah. There's two of them mentioned in Jeremiah. Right. One, 70 years in Babylon, the other 70 years uh, for Babylon, right, when Babylon, and, and, it's, and, and he gives different endings. We have different endings given for those. One is when... Uh, Babylon is visited, right? And the other ending for the other one is when they're going to return, right? And those happen two years apart. Okay. Uh, the process of that, right? I mean, technically it's kind of three years apart when they actually get back um, from when Babylon falls. But, but, but the point being that um, there's two periods of 70 years that are mentioned. And those 70 years both come from Leviticus 26. Exactly. So, so you have to connect what happens to Belshazzar to, to Leviticus 26. And thus it's connected to the 2520. And especially Isaiah chapter 7 connects the, the land that thou abhorrest will be forsaken of both her kings within that 65 years. So... So, so there's lots of different ways. I mean, you have to you have to take up all of the pieces, all of the threads, and and weave them together to see how it all fits. Which, you know, even Miller didn't really see how it all fit. Um, that that's taken time in our movement to understand Leviticus 26 and the applications in Daniel, how it's all connected. Okay, 
now, Sister White tells us very specifically about the central pillar of Adventism. What is the central pillar of Adventism? Well, she talks us about the central pillar and, and um, the foundation and central pillar. So she says the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days. Okay. Now, just i i'm not ignoring the the comment about the sanctuary because i agree with it but if the central pillar of adventism is the 2300 days is that not fairly important to the church and movement as a whole well it's important i just don't think it's the central pillar um it's the foundation the central pillar is the sanctuary i'm just going off of what she wrote yeah well what she said is she says that the foundation and central pillar are are the 2300 days or the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days or the other way around um but the point is she's talking about the foundation and the central pillar, and she's mentioning something that is foundational, that is the 2300 days. Because the 2300 days can't be a pillar because it's a foundation. The foundation is a prophetic message, right? The sanctuary itself is the pillar, and the foundation upon which it rests is the 2300 days. All right. So she never says the 2300 days is the central pillar of Adventism. We're just reading that statement incorrectly. Okay, so what you're referring to is in the earliest form. Yeah, so well, one that we have, the scripture which is above all others had been both the foundation and center pillar of the, uh, of the Adventist faith. Faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So that's one statement where she mentions the scripture, and that's going to be Daniel 8.14. So she's going to call that, that verse both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith. And that's from 4th Spirit of Prophecy 2.58. Um, yeah. And then... She, it was repeated in publication four years later in the Great Controversy of 1888. Yeah. On page. Also, yeah, yeah, and it's in the story of redemption, which is sort of a, a compilation of, of that. Yeah, so you're going to have it in the 1888 Great Controversy and in um, the uh, 1911 Great Controversy. Is it 1911? No. What, what's the other date? Um, you've got the 1888, you've got the 1911. So, yeah, 1911. Okay, that's right. right. Yeah, just didn't sound right to me. Okay, so yeah, so both of them have that. So it's the scripture, technically speaking, the scripture and uh, of Daniel 8 14 that has been both the foundation and the central pillar. Right. Right. So why she says that, um, yeah, there is another statement. Yeah, 17 times the White Estate has published this. And of those 17 times, 
eight of them were published during her lifetime. The majority of which was in the great controversy. Yeah. Now, I find it interesting when we, when we do these kind of studies that we look at the numbers as symbols as we are supposed to. The message of July 18th 2020 was being presented a second time, very much like the message from Christ to Manoah and his wife was presented a second time. How long after the message was initially given to the church. Was this message then presented before the world? And what's the question? <clears throat> How long after this message, the Nashville message, was originally presented to the church. Was this message then presented before the world? So 115 years. Okay. Now, as a question, if we treated those 115 years as shekels, and we were to multiply those shekels by 20 giras, what would that give us? You get 2,300. All right. My question directly then becomes, is a clearer understanding of the periods of the 2300 day prophecy, the 2300 Arab and Boker, a message to the church before we give the final message to the world. Yes. So the main thing for me that has come from the study of this message, um, you know, the whole message dealing with everything Jeff taught and, and what's followed is that Adventism has had an incomplete understanding of the prophetic foundation. Adventism has not understood the 2300 days other than a very surface uh, understanding. And if you go back to you know, what uh, Prescott says during the 1919 Bible conference, the mistake that he's making is instead of understanding the 2300 days better, more thoroughly, to establish the foundation of the message, he's going to do this work of, of taking down the message. You know, Ellen White says, um, let me see here. Um, she says, in a representation which passed before me, so this is sermons and talks, um, it's, in, uh, it's from first sermons and talks. Um, anyway, she says, in a representation which passed before me, I saw a certain work being done by medical missionary workers. Our minister, so she's talking here about Kellogg in the context. Our ministering brethren were looking on, watching what was being done, but they did not seem to understand. The foundation of our faith, which was established by so much prayer, such earnest searching of the scriptures was being taken down pillar by pillar. Our faith was to have nothing to rest upon, nothing to rest upon. 
the sanctuary was gone. The atonement was gone. I realized that something must be done. Now, um, so we know that this was happening first in the medical missionary work, but the ministers weren't really understanding what was occurring. And it's going to follow later on in the ministerial work, more specifically after L. White's death. So there was this, this whole destruction of this message. And, and that's going to be, um, well, I guess it's manuscript 46, May 18, 1904, that she gave that talk in, in Barron Springs, Michigan. Yes, who says, do you wonder that I have something to say when I see the pillars of our faith beginning to be moved? Seductive theories are being taught in such a way that we shall not recognize them unless we have clear spiritual discernment. So, I mean, this is much more, um, I can't think of the word for it. But, but it, it's such a deceptive uh, attack upon the message. Now, the one point that, that to me has always been important, because I was involved in the medical work quite heavily for a few years, first in British Columbia and then in Alberta. And, um, you know, one of the things that I saw happening with the medical work and with the medical missionary work with the health message in Adventism is the introduction of new age, um, new age ideas that are, are being passed off as health reform. And, and if you remember when we were studying um, the uh, examining the foundation and we started looking at Jeff's um, uh, What's it called? I can't think of the name of it. Um, anyway, his book published in 1996. Um, what was that called? The book. Was it the Beyond Belief book? Or? No, no, no. Jeff's book, you know, his main book. That's uh, well, just think of it. Uh, time, a Time in the End? Yeah, The Time in the End. There we go. Time in the so, End magazine. Yeah, so when we looked at the Time in the End magazine, the first uh, article was published in, in an issue that primarily was addressing the new age ideas of health that had come into Adventism. And this is something that, that has always dogged Jeff's, um, or dog, jogged, it's, it's followed Jeff, whatever it is, dogged Jeff's path um, in that, there's always been people who have tried to introduce the health message and the medical missionary work into Jeff's work. And the other thing that has happened, they've always tried to introduce what they considered righteousness by faith with false ideas mixed in. And this was actually happening in this, this period of time in the early 1900s with Kellogg um, his ideas of, of the Holy Spirit, which were connected to these pantheistic ideas, his ideas of, of health, uh, which were really connected to these pantheistic ideas. And then also with the new view on the daily, which ends up being adopted by, uh, you know, the clergy, by the ministers, right? It's also promoted by the health work. So, so the false ideas and conceptions of righteousness by faith and false conceptions and ideas of what the health message is um, always lead to an undermining of the foundation because they draw away from the, the foundation itself. And the foundation itself, prophecy, is to be what guides us. It actually corrects us. And, and we can't mistake the, so when we talk about the medical missionary work, it, it's the right arm of the gospel, 
right? It opens the door so that the body may pass through. That's the idea of the right hand. That's how the way Ellen White. Is the medical missionary work the gospel? I would say that it is part of the gospel. Well, it's the right hand of the right arm of the gospel. It is not the gospel itself. If we were just to do medical missionary work to meet the physical needs of people without addressing the spiritual needs of the people, it would not be the gospel, right? You can't, you can't just in and of itself deal with the health message and, and think that you've done the work of giving the gospel. The work of giving the gospel is we have this door that's open. People are sick. People need health. The, the medical profession fails them time after time. And we have a means that can bring them connected to Christ, whether it's in uh, dealing with their um, addictions or whether it's dealing with specific health problems. Um, by their changing of their diet and their dependence upon God, all the laws of health, uh, people can experience uh, physical healing that will lead to their spiritual healing. But it's not just physical healing alone that, that, that does this. And, and so in the new age, these ideas that have come into, into Adventism and even in this movement, they're a distortion of the health message that was given to us. And, and it's hard to show people this. You know, we're, we're so ingrained as Adventists with a false idea of the health message that we've, we've patterned, we, we get our information from new age sources. We sort of rewrite it um, a little bit. Um, so we, we leave out we leave out, and a lot of them leave out, you know, the spiritual reasons why certain things are supposed to work. And Adventists just buy it up as if it's if it's something that's from the spirit of prophecy. But Ellen White makes no mention of these different things. So, you know, so this is this is a problem. And, and see, I've been studying health since I was a child because my brother was really into uh, the modern health movement, the hippie hippie new age health stuff. So I read tons and tons of books even before I was an Adventist uh, regarding natural health. Um, so, so I'm re really familiar with these ideas and where they come from. But when I see them again repeated, uh, and we, we, so all I'm trying to say here is when we deal with this foundation, the foundation of Adventism can be undermined by a distortion of the message. But if we're going to look at the foundation and central pillar of Adventism, it is a prophetic message that this movement needs to understand. The other messages can be deceptive. They can be, as Ellen White says um, in that one statement, um, seductive. And, and what does that remind us of? Seductive theories. Does this bring us back to the Garden of Eden and the serpent on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or does it bring us back to Baal Peor as well? Yeah, Baal Peor, right? So, so there's all kinds of seductive theories. And, and you can see how even what happened with Parminder, its seductive influence was a rejection of, of the health message, the true health message. Because the true health message has a cross attached to it. It's, it's not a quick fix. It's not, there's not some magical formula that you can do while you're transgressing God's law and receive all of a sudden perfect health. And it's not about man's laws and man's ideas about what health is. We've been, we've been given really clear counsel in the spirit of prophecy 
regarding how, how we are to live. The health message is a complete message on, about a way of life. And, and these simple remedies that we are to use were to direct people to God as the source of healing, not the simple remedies as a source of healing. So, you know, again, one of my little rants about that topic, but to me, um, this is an important point when it comes to what this message is about. It is a prophetic message. Miller's message was a prophetic message. Jeff's message was a prophetic message. Our message is to be a prophetic message. And what we saw happening in 1919 was a move away from a prophetic message to the doctrine of Christ, to not being interested in the 2300 days. And so Prescott goes the opposite direction he, he went. So our, or, or that he should have gone, our movement has brought to Adventism an understanding of the 2300 days that is, is so amazingly uh, consistent and solid because when we examined the foundation, we found that it was laid correctly. And, and to me, this has always been the important part of what we have found is that we can explain the 2300 days and demonstrate it and the 70 weeks in a way that when you do show it to Adventists who are open, they see for the first time how the 2300 days begins and its connection um, to the 70 weeks. But, but more than that, they see how God, how, how all of these verses that we have missed, how we've missed something as Adventists. And of course, we couldn't have found it if we had um, not examined it. If we didn't listen to the repeat of this message, if we, we didn't have this message being repeated. Does, does that sort of agree with what you're saying there, Dwight? Not only does it agree with it, but ex it expands a little bit further. Mm -hmm. But the, the overall picture that, I'm, that I've looked at and that I'm led to look at is just as the warning that was given to Belshazzar gave a revelation of the seven times. Mm -hmm. We've had a message here that was being given a second time made clear a second time to the church. Mm -hmm. If this, if the time frame of this message is taken in the same manner that the 126 shekels multiplied by 20 geras was taken, mm -hmm. here we have this 115 year time period multiplied again by the 20. And we would see that we have this 2300 that is so very important that the church and the movement need to fully understand it. Yeah. And we can see that in the symbol of 2020 as well. Exactly. Now, so you're taking 20, 2020, and right. multiplying by the 115 years from when Ella White first had her visions regarding Nashville and our prediction regarding Nashville. Right. Okay. Now, in this situation, the husband or the movement runs to the church. The church is found sitting in a field ripe for harvest. Mm -hmm. The church chiastically chooses to ignore the message. 
And then the movement again repeats the message to the church. So the question that I was then led to ask, do we take this 40 years, multiply it by four generations as in 160 years, preparing us for a message that is to be given without the help of the church? Now, here again, I'm looking at a calendar. I am not making a prophetic pronouncement. According to the world, 2023 is soon to dawn. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that 2023 will be the 160th anniversary of the establishment of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other points that I've looked at as well, but we cannot refute <clears throat> the idea that we are soon to be in this 160th anniversary of the founding of the church. Is this a type of waymark for us? at this time well I, I think it's important now just a couple of things so we know that symbolically 40 years is a generation right okay so so you're taking here that this this 160 years symbolizes this 40 years times four the four generations correct now and and this has been around for a long time this idea where people have tried to mark particular years as four generations. But Jeff did it differently, right? He used, he didn't try to take 40 years and just say, you know, we're going to mark some event. He, he looked at the characteristics to figure out those generations. And it wasn't until 2016 that we actually had uh, 1957 marking the start of the fourth generation. He, he used to have 1989. Um, which was inconsistent with the progressive destruction of four. Um, so I don't think it's necessary to take these 40 years and mark them on particular dates. You know, every 40 years we have this next generation, we have to have some event that fulfills it. But we can see at least symbolically um, that we have this 160 years represents four times 40. Um, now, 40 years times four generations after 160 years, the message is given without the help of the church. Um, now, so one of the things here, you talk about this field in Judges 13. Right. I know he's in the field the first time. Um, so we just have the field once. Correct. Okay. So you just, when you're going about uh, the movement runs to the church, which is, found sitting in a field ripe for harvest. Um, I don't quite understand that. If you look at... Because we were, we were addressing this earlier. Yeah, I know. Judges 13, 9. God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Yeah, and so the woman makes haste and runs to her husband, not the other way around. That's in the initial portion, yes in the beginning of the chiastic structure. But if you, if we're going, if I'm applying this correctly as a chiasm, okay. then on the other side, the woman is not running. The man comes to her. Okay. Where is that though? That's what I'm trying to find out. 
again, I'm applying the, the situation as we did with the, the, the prophetic mirror, because when Judah went captive after, after Israel had gone captive, In 677, yeah. in the 46 years that followed 1798, there was not a captivity that okay. occurred. There was a release of captivity. Yeah. So in 1311, it says Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man. Right. right. So is that the verse you're using? Part of it, yeah. Okay. Because after verse 13, we don't have that happen. No. Okay. So, so it's not it's not a perfect chiasm in that sense where where it's ordered. But you're going to have Manoah arising um, because his the woman makes haste, runs to her husband, and then Manoah arose and went after after his wife and came to the man. So he's going to follow her. But I was trying to find this after verse thirteen, and I didn't see this. So you're just using this, you're sort of using this chiasm. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd put that there because I don't see the movement running to the church, which is found sitting in a field ripe for harvest. I, I just think that's not in the, the, this, the verses. I don't have a verse showing that. All right. So, but maybe I'm misunderstanding how you're looking at this. Okay, anyway, our time's up. Okay. okay, well, thanks. We're going to have to come back to this tomorrow again. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the study this morning and the things that you are showing us help us to fully understand them. I pray that you can be with each person studying I know that sometimes these things are hard to comprehend. There's many things we miss. We appreciate the participation of each person. And we pray, Lord, that is according to thy will that we can come again to tomorrow morning to study these things. Please be with each one of us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.